this morning by Melissa Shanley, who is Supervisor of uh, Respiratory Care Services at Asheville County Medical Center. Welcome, Melissa. You've been, yeah. you've been here before. I've been here before. I'm happy to be back. Well, I'm glad to have you back. <laughs> and we're talking about a special subject this morning, uh, COPD. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. Um, COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. And the chronic means long-term. Um, obstructive means like a blockage. Pulmonary obviously refers to the lungs, and then a disease is a serious health condition. Um, COPD is a preventable and treatable disease, and the pulmonary aspect is characterized by airflow limitations, which means that people with COPD can't get enough air into or out of their body to meet the needs. Um, it is, like I said, it's treatable. It's not preventable, and it or it's not um, reversible, right. and it moves through four stages. Um. Do you have to wear the uh, breathing apparatus for that? Um, it really depends on what stage you're in. Um, the severe COPDers, they do sometimes have to wear oxygen okay. at home at night sometimes and sometimes all during the day as well. Um, I guess I'm going to ask you this. What happens in the lungs when a person does have this disease? Do, do they... Do they shrink or... Do no. Um, can I do a, a little brief anatomy of yeah. physiology? Okay. Um, Obviously, oxygen is fuel for our bodies, okay? So when we take air into our lungs, it actually loads our blood with oxygen, and then it travels around our body, and it supplies our cells with everything it needs so we can move and we can think and do everything we need to do. And then when we exhale, we're actually exhaling um, CO2, which is the byproduct of oxygen, okay? So if you can't get air into your body, if you can't inhale, you're obviously not going to be able to do the things that you want to do. You're going to suffocate, basically. And if you can't exhale, then you get a buildup of CO2. And CO2 turns into poison in our bodies. So people that have high CO2, they um, might be fatigued. They might be short of breath. Um, they might have headaches. If you've ever heard somebody that was in their house when they had a gas leak or something, mm -hmm. they complain of a headache. It's the same thing. Too much CO2 in your system um, will cause your pH and your blood to drop to a more acidic level and then that's not a nice environment for your, your um, organs to live in. So here you have your diaphragm, this is your muscle of breathing. So when you, rela or when you flex that muscle, it actually um, makes a vacuum happen in your chest cavity and it pulls air into your lungs. And then when it relaxes and it pushes up, you exhale that air. And when, you, when air enters your body through your nose and your mouth, it comes into your trachea, and then it goes into your bronchial tubes that branch off into your lungs, and those tubes get smaller and smaller and smaller, and they eventually will end in alveoli, which are little tiny air sacs. Looks like grapes, okay, at the end of these tubes. And then capillaries go over these air sacs, and that's where the O2 is picked up and brought around your body, or the CO2 is exchanged, and then it comes out. So when you have COPD, there's a couple different things that happen in your body. First, your airways can be irritated and um, swollen, and that causes your body to make a lot of mucus. Okay, so you'll hear people coughing a lot. They have a chronic cough. Um, this mucus is extremely thick, and it can block the airways. Um, another thing that happens is there might be scarring in the airways, and that creates pockets, and that's a really good place for mucus to pool, and you get an infection in there. And then another thing that happens in those alveoli at the end of your lungs, they're normally like balloons, okay? They're, they're really flexible. If you have COPD, um, they become kind of flimsy, like worn out socks almost, mm -hmm. and they air trap. So CO2 gets trapped in there, and it can't get out, and then fresh air can't get in. Now, just so when you get a lung disease, uh, can it affect just one lung or is it always going to affect both lungs? Well, you can have um, a cancer in one lung or something like that, in one lobe of a lung. So it doesn't have to affect both lungs or all areas of your lung. Um, risk, risk factors. Number one is smoking. Smoking. Yeah. Smoking is definitely um, the, the biggest contributor. There are other risk factors, um, air pollution. Um, dirty environments if you work in like a factory or a plant or something like that. I think in the United States we've taken a lot of measures to kind of clean up the workplace right. and you know they're really concerned about people wearing masks if they're in a polluted environment but in other countries um, they still burn a lot of wood or um, biomass fuels so that is definitely a risk factor. There is also um, a genetic disorder 
it's called alpha anatrypsin deficiency. It's a protein deficiency. Yeah. And people that have that um, sometimes will develop COPD. And babies that are have like a low birth weight or um, if you've had a lot of infections as a child, lung infections as a child, that can actually contribute. You know, I, we had a class reunion one time, uh, it's got to be 10, 15 years ago. And uh, one of the participants emailed all of us and said, I will be at the, the event, but I do have COPD. I had never heard of it. Okay. So I remember asking some classmates, you know, what is that? I mean, mm -hmm. th this gal, we were in her 40s. Yeah. You know, can you get it that young? You can get it that young, certainly. Um, I would recommend if you're 40 or older and you have some of the risk factors, if you smoke, definitely, you should be tested for COPD because the sooner you're, you start the treatment, the better you're going to feel and, um, you know, the longer you're going to live. Um, how would you know? I mean, if you're not tested. Um, well, if you're not tested, then the chronic cough, um, wheezing, sometimes shortness of breath, um, any of those things. Sometimes, you know, as people age, they will think that they're short of breath because they're getting older. Um, but if you have any of the risk factors and you're really, really short of breath, especially with exertion, you should go to your doctor and no, ask your doctor. Down. Yeah. Oh. Morning, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the COPD. Sure. Um, COPD, they say, is trick can be triggered by um, air pollution, uh, other things that she mentioned, and also they can be triggered by fragrances and perfumes. I'm wondering if the hospital has ever thought of not having these uh, substances in the hospital like they do uh, not no smoking. Okay. Uh, ACMC is actually a smoke-free uh, workplace. It, it also is um, going to be very shortly a fragrance-free work area. So really? Yeah. So other than, you know, just your personal care items like deodorant and stuff like mm -hmm. that, um, everyone that works there is going to be asked no to do that. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's a good question. <laughs> that is wonderful question. because I know it affects heart patients. I know it affects people who have breathing problems. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's okay. good. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. now, now, I remember years ago, uh, a doctor in town asked, there was a sign out front and asked you not to enter if you were wearing perfume. Mm -hmm. Is that, I mean, is that the case? Well, you know, perfume, heavy scents can really trigger um, bronchospasms associated with asthma, but a lot of times asthma and COPD kind of feel like the same thing. So people that have COPD, they might have trouble breathing air that is um, heavily perfumed, that's got a lot of humidity in it. Well, you it. mentioned fragrance, so that would yeah. be that, would that mm -hmm. fall under that category? Yeah, what about candle. guys that work after shade? Oh yeah. So they would not be allowed? Mm, no, not in the hospital. What if they come in that way? I mean, you know what I mean? I um, mean you know, if, obviously all of the staff members are going to know about the fragrance-free workplace. Right. Um, you know, if it's a patient or something like that, then we can't really do too much about right. that. But a so, visitor? Yeah, a visitor, you know, we, we may ask them to, I don't know, wash, wash their hands yeah. or their wrists or, you know. Right. Because it does affect people that have breathing difficulties, and we want to make it a very um, friendly environment. Wow, okay. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, Pat hi, and hi. everybody. Uh, hi. I have COPD, mm -hmm. and uh, of course I'm on oxygen, and I, I have sleep apnea, and I have a lot of problems. Well, a lot of mine was caused they feel now, other than smoking didn't help it any. I had whoop and cough really, really bad when I was a child, and it uh, affected my um, bronchial tubes. Mm -hmm. So whenever I had a bad cold or anything, I always had a real bad cough and breathing and wheezing. Well, I quit smoking, oh, 20 years ago, whatever, before I had this problem. But that's the best thing I ever did. I would never have lived as long as I am now if I had not. Mm. Well, that's a good tip. For and uh, my husband died from emphysema, COPD. Uh, and, of course, he quit smoking at the same time I did, and he's been gone three years. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible disease because of the fact that when you go to the store 
it's a good thing they have electric wheelchairs and stuff for us that have oxygen tanks because we can't walk long distances because of losing our wind. Mm -hmm. But I have to have somebody go down the soap aisle to buy my laundry soap and that because I can't go near it. Right. Go to the mall, go past the Bath and Body Works, I can pass out. You know, right? it's, oh yeah, it's, it's terrible to be, and you know, I love the smells. Candles. I used to burn them. I can't even have a candle in the house now. It, it's it's a, it's really bad. And when you get my age, of course, it's worse. But I advise everybody that if you can and you smoke, the best thing you can do is quit. I have never yet ever got on anybody about their smoking. Even my kids, they know how I feel. But uh, I feel, well, if you want to get what I have, just look at me. That's what I say. Just look at me. I mean, my friends know, too. You know, I I don't get out as much as I used to or anything. Pat knows who I am. And I'm um, I'm a lively people person. And it's, it's hard to be stuck at home a lot, you know? Sure. sure. But people don't understand how bad COPD can be. And I'm glad you're on the show to explain it because you're doing a very good job. Well, that's that's a very nice endorsement. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate uh -huh. that. Bye. Bye, bye. You guys all have a good day and a nice too. Memorial yeah, weekend. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Same to you. Um, you mentioned about going to a doctor, uh, Melissa. Uh, what about after the diagnosis is made? Uh, and has been confirmed, what happens next? Do they probably have to give you the greater level that you're at? Yeah, we can tell if you um, come to the hospital for a pulmonary function test, um, which is, it's a pretty simple test. It's non-invasive, it's not right. painful, might tire people out a little bit, but it's basically just um, breathing into a machine, different breathing maneuvers. There's a test we do, it's called spirometry, and it measures how much air a person can breathe into and out of their lungs and how long it takes them to do that. And based on that, the doctor can get a pretty good idea of what stage you're in. And then he would place you on um, a COPD management program. Oh, okay. And that um, consists of, of four components. It has um, assessing and monitoring, um, getting rid of your risk factors. So if you smoke, you should quit smoking. Um, the next one is managing stable COPD. And then the last one is managing an exacerbation of COPD. What's that? Um, an exacerbation is um, a, worse, a sudden worsening of symptoms um, from your regular symptoms. Okay. Um, and it happens, it can happen from air pollution, you know, if you smelled something or something set it off that way, it can happen from an infection. Sometimes we don't know why it happens to people, but usually a doctor will um, change your medications a little bit when that happens. Sometimes you end up in the hospital, it just depends on the severity of the exacerbation. Okay. Okay. Melissa, you were talking about asthma being very similar to this mm -hmm. disease, so I take it that this can be any age, even young children can no, have No, young problem. children don't develop COPD, it, it really, I would even say... Even if they have asthma? Yeah, even if they, well, a lot of kids that have asthma, they live in environments um, where their parents smoke. Secondhand smoke, you know, we used to think, oh, it wasn't as bad as smoking. Being in an environment where someone smokes all the time, it's just as bad for you as you smoking yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so asthma and COPD, they share symptoms, um, but asthma, when you have a bronchospasm and then you take a medication, your lungs, your airways open up. With COPD, it doesn't happen that way. Your airways don't open all the way back up. Um, there are medications that you can take for COPD, bronchodilators, um, there's fast acting and, and slow acting. And the slow acting would be like a maintenance drug, you would take that so you wouldn't have an exacerbation. And the fast acting you would take um, during an exacerbation to try to relieve your symptoms. It does make it easier for people to breathe, um, however it doesn't totally re reverse what's going on in your lungs. So. What about medications? Well, always a bronchodilator. Definitely, and you have to visit your physician. And um, so that's the, the, the thing that you, you, you she it's, could um, wear. either a meter dose inhaler or a nebulizer. You know, it's um, nebulized, and you breathe it into your lungs. 
and um, there's so many on the market. You would go to your doctor and try to figure out the best fit for you. Some people tolerate different things, um, and some of the bronchodilators have different actions in your body, so they work better for different people. Um, and then we talked about um, oxygen. Oxygen is actually a drug, and it has to be prescribed by a physician. Um, and you know, people with uh, moderate to severe COPD sometimes have to have oxygen in their home. It's a really good idea. People think, oh, if I have to have oxygen at home, this is the end, you know, but honestly, it increases the chance of survival. Um, it also improves your mental status because it kind of gives people a safety net, right. and when they're getting more oxygen, their brain is working better, so they're thinking better. So it really is helpful. Are you a nurse? No, I'm a respiratory therapist. Okay, okay. You, just, you know so much about this, it's impressive, you know. Been doing it a little while. A little while. <laughs> yeah. So what tells you this, an x-ray, MRI? Uh, um, well, the breathing test, test, the pulmonary function test is um, what's going to tell you if you have COPD and then what stage you're in. Um, if you have an exacerbation, usually the doctor will do an x-ray and a blood test, then they can determine what the exacerbation is being caused by, if it's an infection, and then he can um, prescribe you the medication that you need based on the, the x-ray or the blood test. Now people with COPD, do, do they, are they more prone to pneumonia, like lung? Definitely, and um, I always recommend that people that have COPD kind of stay out of um, areas where there's a lot of people during cold and flu season. Always have your vaccinations if you have COPD, have your pneumonia and your flu vaccine because it can be very, very serious if they get um, a lung infection. But um, stay away from like grocery stores and places where there's a lot of people, you know, that are coughing or congregated together and wash your hands a lot, um, you know, do things that are going to protect you during that season because it can really be dangerous. You no, know, I had, I, a couple years ago, I forgot to get the flu shot. I forgot or just didn't do it, laziness <laughs> maybe, but I had it last fall and um, I'm glad I did because I come down with a, remember Chuck, that horrible cold I had during the winter? And I don't know what would have happened, yeah. pneumonia or whatever, you right. know. I mean, it was like I had to knock off work a few days because I couldn't breathe. I, could, I couldn't stop coughing. And you can't do that in front of a camera. Right, right. Hours. Well, the flu and the pneumonia vaccine are always offered to all of our patients upon um, discharge. Mm -hmm. So um, everybody that leaves the hospital will have the opportunity to have the, the flu and the excellent. pneumonia vaccine. Yeah. That's excellent. Now, Melissa, if somebody has COPD, what would you recommend exercise-wise? Is there a breathing exercise um, technique there that is, do? There is breathing exercises. There's also, um, well, obviously exercise is going to be one of the things that help you um, increase your tolerance for all the things that you do throughout the day, okay? Because when you have COPD, you, you have to accept that your life is going to change. You know, you have to make changes in your, um, your list of activities. If you have um, things that take a lot of energy, you may want to do those first thing in the morning, you know, or when you feel like you have more energy, and then you have to conserve energy for breathing. Mm -hmm. So um, you want to exercise if you have mild or uh, media, medium to severe COPD, which would be stages like three and four, you would probably enroll in like a pulmonary rehab. Mm -hmm. And that's prescribed by a physician. And the exercise plan is, is catered right to the individual, to their tolerance. And in a, a rehab, you're always monitored. There's always somebody supervising you, your heart rate and um, your level, your severity of shortness of breath. So people feel safe there. Um, if it's nice outside, go for a, a little walk outside. Just watch out for really humid days or really cold days because that's when you're going to have problems with the air. Right. If it's humid, stay inside, do things inside, um, have an air conditioner with a clean filter. If it's cold and you have to go out, you know, to don't shovel or anything like that. You know, the activities that you can get somebody else to do, certainly get somebody else to do them. But if you have to go outside on a cold day, put a scarf over your nose and mouth and that'll help to warm the air before it enters your lungs and that'll make you feel feel better. That probably would answer my next question was uh, how, how, what you can do to make yourself feel better. So obviously um, keeping yourself in, in, in activity and exercise. Yeah, exercise definitely. And like I said, kind of changing your expectations. Um, you don't want to get frustrated or anxious because when you're anxious, your heart beats faster and then your body needs more oxygen. So um, just acceptance. Don't get frustrated. Try to go to a COPD support group. We have one at the hospital. Um, there's tons of them nationally. Um, we have a better breathers group 
at the hospital and it's a really nice environment for people to um, share coping mechanisms. I'm going to have you give that information out in okay. a second, okay? But well, I have sure. one last question sure. for you, okay? Yeah. Uh, pursed lip breathing. Okay. Pursed lip breathing is um, an exercise that people with COPD can do at any time, but really it helps when you're short of breath. And what it does is it helps to release all of the CO2 in your lungs and then make room for fresh air. So we can do it if you want to practice it with me. <laughs> you can put one hand on your belly and one hand on your chest. And you're going to take a nice deep breath in through your nose. And then purse your lips and push your stomach in when you exhale. Okay, so you would breathe in through your nose and purse your lips and exhale. And what that does is it releases all of the old air from your lungs yeah. and it helps make room for new new fresh air to come in. One of the things so, you teach your patients. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah, along with um, nutrition, you know, all of that kind of thing we talk about. Where can, what are the days that this um, facility is open to help these people out there? Do you have information on that? The pulmonary function lab mm -hmm. is open Monday through Friday and it's by appointment only. You have to have a prescription from your physician um, and we do tests every hour. Like I said, it takes about 45 minutes mm -hmm. on from 8 o'clock till 5 o'clock, I think. And then um, the Better Breathers group, we have that um, the first Wednesday of each month and it's from 2 to 3 p.m. at the hospital in the Education Center. Yeah. And um, it's really great. We share a lot of ideas. We have uh, speaker, different speakers every month that come in, talk about um, physical therapy, um, sleep. You know, sleep is very important for people with COPD because they have to conserve that energy. Um, if they have problems sleeping at night, they want to see their doctor about that. Don't just take over-the-counter sleep aids because that can be very dangerous for people with COPD. It might relax them a little too much. That was so. going to be, a, you just mentioned it, uh, as a physical, or as a uh, respiratory therapist, do you have to relate it all to physical therapists? Is there anything in common there at um, all? You know, we did have a physical therapist come in and talk to the COPD support group um, because, you know, you want to sh tell people about how they can exercise without um, becoming short of breath. So sitting in a chair, doing things with your arms, um, they have those little pedal machines that they use. Um, you know, there's different exercises that you can definitely do to increase your exercise tolerance, um, but still not become too short of breath. Good morning, you're on the air. Hi, yes, I was wondering if you could describe the last stages of COPD and what to look for. Um, well, it's not fun. <laughs> um, I would say usually in the last stage of COPD, you're probably hospitalized. Um, people will be on oxygen. Um, you know, the amount depends on the individual, but sometimes we'll put them on a breathing machine. And a lot of times you'll see people with end-stage COPD and they just can't catch their breath no matter what. They can be sitting in their bed and you know they kind of will usually sit a certain way with their arms on a table because that releases some of the pressure on their lungs um but it's it's not fun it's not fun to watch and it's 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 um pretty Horrible. upsetting yeah, yeah yeah okay all right thank you thank you um this i know is there did you want to make an announcement sure yeah we um this is not for copd uh patients but this is for kids who are diagnosed with asthma mm. we have a camp a summer camp this year it's going to be held on july 30th through august 3rd and um it's a half day camp they come in at 8 30 in the morning and they leave at noon but we have so much fun this is the fourth year i think we've done this and it is a blast. And the kids learn so much about self-care and about what triggers their asthma. We take field trips. We exercise together. We do crafts. It is just really, really a ball. So July 30th through the... Through August 3rd. And where's it going to be at? It's actually, we meet at the hospital every day, but on the field trips, we have transportation furnished by Community Care Ambulance. Okay. So um, we go out to one of the uh, metro parks and we do a gorge hike. Oh, okay. um, we go to Geneva on the lake and we swim. Um, we just, we have such a great time. And it kind of shows kids that, you know, because you have asthma doesn't mean that you have to sit still. You know, you really need to kind of learn what triggers your asthma, what it feels like when you're having an asthma attack so you can tell somebody. Can you outgrow asthma? You can outgrow asthma. I think yeah, my son you did. you don't outgrow the disease. Once you have asthma, you have it, but you'll outgrow the symptoms. And oh. sometimes you'll have a late onset of asthma too. It can happen during pu puberty. Mm -hmm. I had so, it 
upper 30s. Yeah. For about a five year period. And then then it went away? Yeah. The symptoms yeah. went away. It might have just been like an airway sensitivity. Your airways got really, really sensitive for some reason and things would set you off. Mm -hmm. So that happens too. So it's not unusual that an adult would develop it. Um, it's it's less common than in children. Yeah, it's Leave it to you, Chuck, to get yeah. it. Yeah. I would develop it when I'm 37 years old. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Very interesting, Melissa. I appreciate you coming in. Thank you for having um, me. I, I just think it's a subject that we need to approach and talk Definitely. about and uh, appreciate you uh, coming in and doing that. Come back and see us. I would say that. Okay.